I'm Julian Assange. Roger, I'll get you in constraints. Editor of WikiLeaks. We've exposed the world's secrets. These documents belong to the United States government. Been attacked by the powerful. The United States strongly condemns. Hey, quit asking questions. He broke the law. Illegally shoot the son of a... For 500 days now, I've been detained without charge. But that hasn't stopped us. Today, we're on a quest for revolutionary ideas that can change the world tomorrow. From humble origins, my next guest, Imran Khan, became a household name as captain of Pakistan's victorious cricket team. He then left sports and launched his Movement for Justice party in the most dangerous political environment on earth. For years, Khan's anti-corruption party was ignored. In 2007, US State Department cables referred to him as Pakistan's one-man party. But Pakistan is changing fast. Over the last two years, widespread anger over US drone strikes and corrupt political dynasties has driven millions to his cause. I want to know, why is he now front runner to be the next leader of Pakistan? Hi, Julian. Imran. How are you? I'm, I'm all right. I have a bit of a cold, but I think that's a good thing because my voice is a bit sexier than normal and I have to compete with you. <laughs> I'm, I thought we are having interesting times here, but you are having a very interesting time. Well, I think your interesting time is a bit more interesting than my interesting time. I saw these videos of your rallies last night, so I think this is great, but I worry you're going to get blown up. So, <laughs> so I hope your interesting time well, doesn't get any more interesting. Put, put it this way. Julian, you've got to go sometime. Yeah, this I is... I mean, we'll go for some cause rather than just... Like, I mean, I was, you know, when I set up this cancer hospital, so I used to see healthy people coming in and six months later they were gone. So um, I have a completely different attitude to life and death. You're not around for long, so you might as well make the most of it. <laughs> you don't realize the impact your, uh, the WikiLeaks made, not just uh, uh, you know, from just the let me let me pause you in, Ram. You're you're broken up for some reason. We've we've just lost you for a minute. Um, okay, you're you're back again. Uh, you know, the, the impact they made all over the world, but in Pakistan, the way they exposed all these two-faced politicians, you know, who were sucking up to the Americans and saying, um, uh, in private, telling them how great they were, and uh, you know, uh, sucking up to them, and in public giving completely opposite statements. So it was a, especially this one religious, uh, this guy who's a, who's a cleric who leads this religious party. And he literally told the Americans, he says, look, if you back me to become the prime minister, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And he's considered the most anti-American politician here. So anyway, so it was a great, uh, it really exposed a lot of people here. Uh, Imran, can you describe what, what are the big power factions in Pakistan? Is it the ISI, the army, is it the Supreme Court, uh, the old families? How would you describe the, the basic power structure of Pakistan? Um, well, the battle in Pakistan, just like in the Middle East, is of a status quo, an entrenched status quo, what you call the power structure, benefiting from the system, and the majority of population wanting a change. So what you see in the Middle East is exactly this. Whereas the West looks upon Muslim societies and there's some war going on between fundamentalists and liberals, Islamic fundamentalist liberals. Actually, this is really the divide in, our, in the Muslim world, which is why everyone got surprised by the Arab Spring. In Pakistan, what the following I have now is the same, are the same people who are coming out in the Middle East, people wanting a change an anti-status quo movement. Now, what is the status quo in Pakistan? We have political mafias. All the political parties have now got together against me. So they have sort of... Uh, but this, is, know, this, is, this, is, a good, this is a good sign, isn't it, Imran, that if, if people are gathering around to oppose you, they, they must be scared. Oh, they are petrified because the last time in Pakistan we saw rallies as big as the... The, the two I took out, one in, uh, uh, in Lahore and one in Karachi, was 40 years ago by Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, the father of Benazir. And when the, that's, 
these sort of numbers turned out, he swept the election. He just swept and he was an underdog. Mm. And all the status quo parties were blown away. So that's why the people got scared. We researched the WikiLeaks cables from Islamabad to see what they said about you. And in 2007, the US ambassador said, Khan, whose PTI party is effectively a one-man show, has little to lose. His credibility rests in his self-created role as a politician who sticks to his principles. And he is popular with the Pakistani intelligentsia and elements of diaspora. But Khan has never been able to turn his starring role as captain of Pakistan's only team to win the international cricket championship into an effective political party. That's obviously changed now. What's happened in the last few months? Well, Julian, what happened was that um, our media, uh, from about 2005 onwards, we suddenly had uh, a proliferation of independent television channels. And the most, um, the most watched programs became current affair programs. So today, if you watch our television, it's like having eight Jeremy Paxman at prime time. So at 8 p.m. you have top these, these guys who become opinion makers, like Jeremy Paxman, you will have on, on the main, uh, on all the channels, and at prime time, where you would, for instance, have Big Brother in England or some soap opera, hey, at prime time, People want to watch current affair programs. And such is the desire um, to understand the political situation of people, such is the interest there that they are at prime time and they, they have the highest viewership. And so what's happened in the past six months? I mean, there's really been a, a, a tremendous rise. The opinion polls that I've read uh, have your popular support at something between 60 to 80%. Uh, of the Pakistani population. But perhaps you can describe this, um, how your party has grown in size um, and momentum, and, and what's it like in, for you trying to manage uh, this incredibly fast-growing organisation? Uh, uh, first of all, I boycotted the elections in 2008 uh, because, uh, you know, these ele elections were manipulated by the Bush administration. They brokered a deal between Musharraf and Benazir, where all her corruption cases were, and not only her, other crooked politicians, they were given an amnesty by Musharraf. And this was a deal brokered by the Americans, and it was called the NRO, National Reconciliation Ordinance. So in the name of reconciliation, uh, the Americans uh, got Musharraf and Benazir together. And Condoleezza Rice, in her latest book, triumphantly writes about it that how Bush gave her a pat on the back when she got them together. And uh, so, 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 so I, and along with a lot of other parties, boycotted the election because we felt that this was pre-poll rigging. Mm. Uh, uh, for a while, my craft went down because we stayed out of elections. And then as the governments began to mess up, because once the criminals came to power, corruption broke all records in Pakistan. Naturally, because when you allow crime to pay, crime multiplies. And so as they went up, people started remembering that I warned everyone when I was boycotting the election that this election is, a dis uh, is going to be a disaster for the people of Pakistan. It's only meant for the uh, Bush administration to have a puppet, one remove one puppet. Musharraf was struggling, so he was likely to go. They wanted another puppet government so they could pursue this war on terror where our own army was bombing our own people. Yeah. And so, uh, so whatever I was saying, corruption went through the roof. The war on terror was, has been devastating for Pakistan for, uh, because 40,000 Pakistanis have been killed in a war we had nothing to do with. Uh, basically, our own army killing our own people and them, them doing suicide attacks on, on Pakistani civilians. And the country has lost $70 billion in this war. Total aid has been less than 20 billion. So I was saying all these things and suddenly it was, uh, it just resonated with the people. And almost two years ago, my graph started going up. Now since the big rallies, the whole political scene has changed. We are seeing now 
politicians rushing to me. So people who are electables, realizing that the vote bank now belongs to me, they're coming to join me. I, I heard that even, even Musharraf tried to say uh, to you, um, you, you PM me president. Well, you see, Musharraf uh, uh, does not understand what's happening in Pakistan because he's outside. His whole idea of politics is on the Facebook. He doesn't realize that on the ground in Pakistan, the situation is, is completely different. Number one, he'll be the biggest liability to get allied to. Mm. But number two, he's responsible for the mess. He's responsible for this record corruption because he's the one who gave them amnesty, the, the criminals. Nowhere in the world are criminals given amnesty and they're allowed to contest elections again and then get into power. And secondly, this war on terror, so he's responsible for both. If you look at, say, the Soviet Union, which also had a lot of corruption, the people said, well, um, well, at least the black market is a market. <clears throat> so you can have some kind of trading. It helps you get around regulations which are impeding business. What is the problem with corruption in Pakistan? Why is, why is corruption bad for Pakistan? Just to give you another statistic, that in our entire history of 60 years, the total debt accumulated by Pakistan is about, was five trillion. In just four years, the debt has gone up from, from five to 12 trillion. So we are now borrowing to, to service our debts. So if out of 1.8 trillion, debt servicing is 800 billion. Half of it goes to debt servicing, 600 billion goes to pay for the army, 180 million people have 200 billion rupees to live on. So clearly the country is unviable. Yeah. So in, in case of Russia, they could still go on. In case of Pakistan, we are looking at uh, the abyss. We are, we are looking at uh, 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 us going down the drain. The country is heading towards complete chaos. We don't have money to run, run the country. And at the moment, load shedding, we don't have money to buy fuel to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, put it in a power generation. So because we cannot buy fuel for a power generation or the government can't, there's almost 14 hours load shedding. There's no electricity for 14, for 14 hours, hours a day. day. Uh, and and the corruption in Pakistan, the, the tax evasion uh, is one thing, but the, the stealing of money from the Treasury, uh, how much of that ends up back in Pakistan, i.e. it's just taking from the poor or the middle class uh, and transferring it to the rich in Pakistan, versus how much of the money is taken out of Pakistan and stashed into London banks or stashed into Swiss banks or US companies? So two things. Number one, because we do not have money to pay for, to get furnace oil for our power generation, the country is having load shedding. There's no electricity here for 14 to 15 hours in a day, 18 hours in the rural areas. That means that farmers can't run their, uh, uh, the tubers to water their crops. That means factories and industries are closing down. That means there's massive unemployment on top of inflation. Uh, so that's one aspect of corruption. The second is that most of this money ends up in Swiss bank accounts. Uh, most of our top, almost, I am the only political leader who made his money outside Pakistan, and I have everything in Pakistan and in my name. Apart from me, all political leaders, head of political parties, they have bank accounts abroad, they have properties abroad, and it's not declared. So this money, most of this money, ends up outside the country. But let's move on to the US. Um, tell me about this assassination of Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. What was the, the feeling in Pakistan? That the ISI was hiding Osama bin Laden, that they are incompetent? Why uh, was Osama bin Laden in Pakistan? Julian, what you must understand is that Osama bin Laden was trained by the ISI and CIA. The all-Al-Qaeda were trained by the CIA and ISI. 
about 20 years back. So this, this, uh, these people were assets of the Pakistan army. <clears throat> They were trained by the Pakistan army and the ISI, financed by the CIA, but they were fighting the Soviets. And, and for a long time, these groups had very close uh, uh, association with the Pakistan secret agencies. Now suddenly comes 9-11, and you do a 180 degrees turn. I mean, Musharraf does a 180 degrees turn. But it didn't mean that all along the way, people would have accepted this. Because here were people trained for jihad. Jihad, in this, key, uh, in this case, means fighting a foreign occupation. So how are you going to convince them having indoctrinating not only uh, these uh, militant groups, but also your own agencies, that their fighting foreign occupation is, uh, is a religious duty? People right, right some case. subset in the ISI. Some people, perhaps, who had dealt with him in the past who were still loyal. Of course, people who would have thought that fighting another foreign occupation, which is now the yeah. US, is also a religious duty. Of course, it, it's possible. Is, is there a feeling that the US is helping uh, clean out militants in Pakistan, or is there a feeling that it's a violation of Pakistani sovereignty? This was the, the ultimate humiliation. Here is a country which has, at that time, had lost about 35,000 people dead, fighting America's war. Uh, and as I said, the country had lost far more uh, in terms of uh, material uh, losses than the aid given to us. So, and the government puts the figure to $70 billion, aid under $20 billion. So therefore, here is a country that's supposed to be sacrificing for the US. And then our ally did not trust us and actually came and, and killed someone on our own soil. It was that, the two factors combined, A, the sacrifices, and secondly, here's an ally, which, are we a friend or an, an enemy? So forget about what the government thought. I'm talking about the people of the country who didn't really know what was going on because uh, was the, as the army was being accused, the army might have kept them or, yeah. or either they were incompetent or they said either they were incompetent or in cahoots. But what about the people? So it, it, there was, if anything, there was a very strong reaction born out of a feeling of humiliation. And do you think that, you know, that the US argued that um, Osama bin Laden is a terrorist uh, responsible for the deaths of many Americans, so they have a right to to go in and take him out. Um, All I'm saying is that uh, war on terror is not, is somehow the confusion is that you win a war on terror by bombs and, uh, uh, you know, killing people. Actually, war on terror is one when you win hearts and minds of people. If you lose that war, this is, th there is no way this is going to end. I mean, Pakistan is more radicalized today than it was eight years back. Pakistan is more polarized today. It's a polarized society than it was eight years back. Whatever we do, military is not a solution. We have failed for eight years. The Americans have failed for 11 years. What, what are we going to do now which is different? And as Einstein said, madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. It's not going to happen. There's no military solution. Only way is a political solution. Pakistan can play a part in the political solution. Mm. We do not have politicians who are capable or credible enough. So you need elections, a credible government, hopefully ours. We'll start a political dialogue, help the Americans in an exit strategy from Afghanistan. It's the only way out of this. Imran, we discovered a cable in 2009 from the Islamabad uh, embassy. Prime Minister Giuliani and the Interior Minister Malak went into the embassy and offered to share NADRA. That is the voting record system for all voters uh, in Pakistan. And a front company was set up in the United Kingdom, International Identity Services, which was hired as the consultants for NADRA to squirrel out the NADRA data for all of Pakistan. It, se it seems to me that that is a theft of some national treasure of Pakistan, the entire 
Pakistani database registry of its people. Julian, it's so shameful. Uh, you know, never has a country's ruling elite for personal benefits, never have they betrayed their people as much as this elite under Musharraf and the current elite. Um, not only have they done this, there have been countless number of people who have disappeared in Pakistan on suspicion of terrorism. There were Pakistanis or people from Pakistani soil handed over to the Americans on mere suspicion of, of, uh, of, of them being involved in some terrorism. And people have disappeared. Uh, people are eliminated. Suspects are eliminated through drone attacks. Um, and not only suspects, their wives, their children, their neighbors are eliminated. Never has there been any inquiry in were these people innocent or not. No country has ever been bombed by its own ally as we are being bombed in this country. Um, as I said, it's the most shameful period of our history. Never has a country's ruling elite betrayed its people so much as this current ruling elite. Uh, and for personal benefits, because all of them have bank accounts abroad, they have money lying abroad, and guess what? The Americans know all about their accounts. Mm -hmm. They're, they're uh, illegal. Money siphoned off from here. How, how would you reconfigure the Pakistan relationship with the United States? Would it, would it be a complete severance? What would you do? You would permit drone strikes? What kind of intelligence cooperation? What, what would you do in practice? Uh, have a relationship based on dignity, self-respect. So it should be a, a relationship like the US has with India. It should not be a relationship of a client-master relationship. And even worse here, Pakistan has a hired gun being paid to, to uh, kill America's enemies. It's, not, it's a relationship that has failed. It's neither delivered to the people of Pakistan nor has it delivered to the Americans. Uh, the only thing that, you, that the Americans should be told is that, look, there will be no terrorism from our side. But you can only do that if you're no longer perceived to be a stooge of the Americans. <laughs> only a sovereign, credible government can then deal with terrorism. At the moment, the terrorists or the militants have declared jihad against Pakistan government. So they're killing our soldiers and our, and, our, and our police guys, saying that these are collaborators of the Americans. So the moment you pull out of this war, this jihad goes. The moment the jihad goes, we then can start sifting who the real enemy is within our borders. And then only can we guarantee that there will be no terrorism from our side. So therefore, number one step has to be pull out of this war, no more aid. We become a sovereign, independent state, and the relationship with the U.S. should be of dignity and self-respect, no longer of a client-master uh, relationship. You, know, you're, you give a good description of how the, the war on terror in Pakistan has been counterproductive. It's created enmity towards the Pakistani government. 35,000 to 45,000 Pakistanis have lost their lives. Why do you think the United States pursues its agenda, its drone, drone strikes in Pakistan, if, if the US ambassador even is writing back saying that it's counterproductive? What is the, the driving forces from the US? Well, Julian, I think it's because the, uh, the uh, just like us, the policy in US is being driven by Pentagon. It's the, it's the army people who are driving this policy because only military people always think of military solutions. If you look at Vietnam and you listen to, I think, was it General McNamara or someone? I just remember a long time ago, I mean, him all, them also saying way back in late 60s that we've turned the corner, we're about to win the war, a few more men, a few more bombing, and this will do the trick. So generals always think like that. One final question, uh, Imran. Um, have you met A.Q. Khan and what do you think about the father of the Pakistani nuclear bomb? I have met A.Q. Khan, uh, you know, uh, uh, not recently, but, uh, a, a couple of years back, but I, I've known him for 20 years because he gave the first donation to 
when I started building the cancer hospital, he was the one who came forward first. Um, he is a hero. He's, he's a hero worshipped in Pakistan because Pakistanis look upon him as someone who gave us security. In other words, uh, uh, the same reason given by the Israelis that they needed the bomb because they are surrounded by um, hostile neighbors is the same in Pakistan. We fought three wars with India, which is seven times the size of Pakistan. And there's a lot of insecurity in the country. And this is the guy who's supposed to have secured us. So from that point of view, he's hero worshipped in Pakistan. Uh, what I think of him, I don't really know. Was he involved in this proliferation or not? There are two points of view. One, uh, uh, you know, by the Americans and Musharraf. The other is A.Q. Khan himself mm. saying that, look, I'm ready to uh, uh, um, uh, give all evidence that I never was involved in this. Now, I don't really know. He admitted on television that he was involved in it, but he said he was forced by Musharraf to do that. So I don't really know the truth behind it, Julian. Personally, I am anti-nuclear. I am uh, totally uh, uh, for a world where, which has no nuclear, nuclear bombs. Uh, but at the moment, this, the way the situation is, uh, people will argue here that ever since we've had acquired nuclear weapons, even though there's been a lot of tension, we've come close, but there has been no war between Pakistan and India. And before the nuclear weapon, there were three wars. Yeah. So people will argue from that point of view. Okay. Uh, Imran, thank you very much. Um... Thank you, and I wish you all the best, because I think you've done a great thing. What you did with WikiLeaks, you know, freedom of information is the most important thing because we are basically controlled uh, by people withholding information. And this is really a power. And as I said, I'm the biggest beneficiary in this country. These mafias would have just controlled information and people like me would never have had a chance of, uh, uh, of coming to power in Pakistan. So thank you. Thank and you. All the best. Thank you, Imran. Good luck.